The risk is absolutely very real indeed. I don't think it will come so much from the deliberate, aggressive use of nuclear weapons by any nuclear armed state, except perhaps in circumstances where they feel their very existence is imminently at risk. And that's because of the normative taboo against the aggressive use of nuclear weapons that's still very widespread. But the risk of catastrophic miscalculation, human error, system error, compounded perhaps by cyber sabotage is very real indeed. We saw that during the course of the Cold War years when it was not a function of statesmanship, it was not a function of inherent system stability that we avoided catastrophe all those years and the years since. It's been a matter of sheer dumb luck sheer dumb luck because the risk of catastrophe is omnipresent. Human error, human idiocy uh, is boundless in these situations. And in the context of um, present command and control arrangements with countries like India and Pakistan and so on, much less sophisticated uh, than was the case with the Soviet Union and the United States during all those Cold War years and, and still, uh, those risks are compounded with more players in the game. And of course, with the tensions as they are now with the United States and Russia, the United States and China, the prospect of situations arising which can escalate crazily out of control beyond anybody's expectations is very real indeed. So yes, the risk is real and we really do have to uh, take it very, very seriously. The immediate need is nuclear risk reduction, which I would describe in terms of what I call the four Ds. First of all, doctrine, getting agreement on no first use. Secondly, deployment, reducing the number of weapons that are out of storage, primed, ready to go. Three, de-alerting, reducing the decision-making time for the use of, sorry, ex extending the decision-making time for the use of those weapons. So they're not on hair trigger alert. And the fourth D is decreasing, decreasing numbers. We've got over 13,000 at the moment. We desperately need to reduce that number down to very, very low numbers indeed. And that is doable. Uh, what we have to do is harness the power of emotion, the power of reason, and also the power of pragmatism. I think with effort to reduce those risks and to work towards a world without nuclear weapons uh, coming from all three levels. It has to come top down uh, with the leadership of the nuclear armed states recognizing their responsibility as Reagan and Gorbachev did all those years ago uh, to create a world without nuclear weapons because a nuclear war, as they said, uh, cannot be won and must never be fought. It requires top-down leadership and motivation. It requires peer group motivation and energy from the wider international community, both through the UN system and through that group of allied countries like Australia with the United States that are capable of exercising some influence um, on the big guys. Uh, and it requires bottom-up effort, obviously, from uh, the civil society community, uh, from NGOs, organizations like Luxembourg Forum are crucial in energizing that support. And that, that effort um, has to be, as I said, a function of emotion and reason and pragmatism all at once. We must never underestimate the utility of emotion, that recognition of the role of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is demonstrating that nuclear weapons are the most indiscriminately inhumane ever devised. And to recognize that, um, that the normative taboo that I mentioned at the outset does still have some resonance with leaders, but that's not enough by itself. You've got to harness the power of reason as well. The leaders of the nuclear armed states know that nuclear weapons are a catastrophic uh, risk to our common humanity and morally unacceptable. Indeed, their, their devastating awfulness is one of the reasons why they regard them as so attractive as deterrents. We have to comp consolidate or complement rather uh, that emotional appeal with a reasoned appeal, making it clear in our argument, in our documentation, in all our efforts, 
that the risks of holding nuclear weapons far outweighs any possible benefits uh, that they could involve. Um, and that that's true, whether the context be that of superpower competition or small countries wanting some kind of guarantee that they won't be invaded. There's a strong argument can be made in each of these contexts that nuclear weapons are no use at all and the risks of anyone having them are, are gigantic. So. That's emotion, that's reason, but there's also got to be an element of pragmatism. I think we have to be realistic in the kind of disarmament agenda we pursue. And charging after global zero, complete nuclear elimination within some sort of finite, finite time frame, uh, is not going to be very realistic. What we need to do is to focus on what I call that risk reduction agenda, the four Ds, doctrine, deployment, decreased numbers, de-alerting. That's the, that's the way of... Uh, giving some real content to the necessary task of uh, nuclear elimination. Well, the fact that we have been 75 years without a nuclear catastrophe does breed its own complacency. People think uh, that this is a risk that people talk about, but it's just not going to happen to us. Uh, well, that's a miscalculation, as I said, and the reality is uh, that the world is in fact more dangerous now uh, than it has been for a very long time. The bulletin of nuclear scientists, atomic scientists, uh, has of course just recently uh, set the the, uh, the atomic clock, the doomsday clock, at 100 seconds to midnight, as it was last year, the closest in the clock's history, which demonstrates the scale of the risk, and in particular that risk of, of something just going fundamentally wrong, not a deliberate aggressive use of nuclear weapons, but use through miscalculation or system or human error. The risk is absolutely real, and it's one that has to be addressed. I think one way of... Uh, one way of trying to recapture that public concern about nuclear weapons is to harness the experience, as horrible as it's been for everyone, of the pandemic, and to make the point that there's not just one, but three existential risks out there that could threaten life on this planet as we know it. One, of course, we now can see for ourselves is pandemics. The second, of course, although it's longer term, is climate change. CO2, and the third is nuclear weapons. All three of those destructive forces are capable of killing life on this planet, destroying life on this planet as we know it. And if that message can get through uh, to the wider community, some of that complacency that we've um, seen for so long, and that's made the task of nuclear campaigners so difficult, uh, will be, uh, that the task will be easier, I think, to, uh, to generate that momentum. I don't think we're on the verge of a Cold War like the one between the Soviet Union and the United States was for so long, mainly because there's no obvious ideological competition of the kind that was central to that standoff between those two great powers. Um, the reality is that the, uh, the risks, however, because of the tensions associated with superpower rivalry, uh, America and Russia still, America and China, um, these are very real and remind us of just how many times during the Cold War um, tensions did come bubbling to the surface and create environments where there was a real risk of catastrophe. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, people will remember the Abel Archer uh, uh, scare in 1983. When you've got uh, heightened tensions and when you've got huge nuclear armaments and when you've got a lot of those armaments on hair trigger alert and when you've got a, a continued belief by military establishments in the deterrent utility of these weapons, uh, terrible things can happen. And I think we have to recognise that we are back, if not in traditional Cold War territory with big ideological competition, we're back in the real world of, of major power, great power tension, uh, which carries with it really gigantic risks. Well, the extension of New Start with the Biden administration cooperating in that was a crucial reset. Uh, but of course, it's not the whole answer. It does continue to operate to constrain deployments of strategic weapons. That's one of my four Ds. But it doesn't do anything about de-alerting them, and it certainly doesn't do anything about decreasing the stockpiles. Moreover, of course, the other arms control 
agreements that we need to make a safer and saner world are either dead, dying, fragile, or non-existent. I'm referring to the INF, I'm referring to the Open Skies Treaty, and I'm referring to the absence of any progress on treaties in, for space-based weapons, for hypersonic weapons, or any systematic uh, capacity to handle the problem of cyber um, sabotage and cyber threats, uh, which could be a, a huge uh, security problem for us all in the future. So the extension of New Start is very important, but it is, is just a beginning. We have a huge task ahead. I'm an optimist about the possibility of a solution to decrease tensions and ultimately even achieve complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. I don't think it will be achieved by circus diplomacy, Trump style. I think it will be achieved by a serious return to step-by-step -step professional negotiations in which concessions are offered on both sides and progress builds confidence from there. The reality is that even with its present and growing stockpile, I don't think North Korea is a serious aggressive threat uh, to its neighbors or the wider world. Uh, the North Koreans know that to be homicidal is to be suicidal and that their primary objective, which is regime survival, would be put completely at risk if they were to take any aggressive first use step uh, with those weapons. So I think if we can create, and what they're all about is regime survival. What they're all about is, is creating an environment in which while there's no political change, uh, the economic environment improves for their people. So there's less stress on the regime from inside, as well as of course, an avoidance of stress and possibility of intervention from the outside. If steps can seriously be taken to persuade the North Koreans uh, that the West, the rest of the world is serious about uh, guaranteeing their security, their survival, not in the business of regime change, uh, but in the business of serious negotiation, then I think we can move through a phases of a freeze and then a gradual de-escalation of the, uh, the nuclear environment. Achieving complete denuclearization uh, will be a very long haul, but I do think we can take the tension out of this. And it's a, it's a crucial task ahead. And I think the Biden administration, again, gives us a much better chance of uh, achieving that than anything that might have been possible under the previous administration. And of course, Russia's role in this um, will be important as it has been in the past because Russia is very much a player in the larger Northeast Asian security context. And one of the kinds of solutions ultimately for the North Korean problem is to create a, a Northeast Asian nuclear weapons free zone um, involving the, the present um, the both Koreas and Mongolia and Japan and so on, uh, with guarantees by the other nuclear weapon states. And Russia will be in a very important part of those negotiations if we can get that far. The Nuclear Ban Treaty, Prohibition Treaty, is a very important normative step forward in creating an environment where nuclear weapons are delegitimized uh, with the voice of so many countries supporting those negotiations, bringing it to conclusion and now into effect. But the notion that any one of the existing nuclear armed states will actually sign, ratify, implement that treaty is, I'm afraid, a pretty fanciful thought at the moment. Maybe in an ideal world, a country like Great Britain, United Kingdom might be the least likely to think that nuclear weapons are crucial for its survival or status. But I can't see any of the nuclear armed states um, signing up to this. The, the reasons are not only geopolitical and psychological, not wanting to, to give up the sort of status that's perceived to go with these things, uh, but they're also quite technical. Um, there's real problems with the ban treaty as it's presently drafted in terms of verification, a problem which might be solved over time, but crucially in terms of enforcement. And nuclear armed states are concerned that if they give up their weapons uh, and go to zero, if there's no appropriate international or effective international enforcement mechanism in place, then um, you know, they're going to be at risk and they're just not going to take that risk. It's a very important um, responsibility for not only the nuclear arms states to take seriously, however, the task of disarmament, but for that 
to be also the case for the nuclear umbrella states, countries like my own, like Australia, who um, are not willing to sign up either to the nuclear uh, ban treaty uh, because of the risks that would pose for us in terms of our alliance or partnership uh, commitments. So I think the reality is that um, we're never going to get the indefinitely foreseeable future buy-in from anybody to the, uh, the nuclear ban treaty. But of course, that doesn't mean that we should in any way abandon the, the aspiration for ultimately getting to a nuclear weapons free world. I don't think it's a realistic dream in the short to medium term, but it is a dream we must never abandon for the longer term. I think the crucial need is to be realistic about the kind of agenda that will bring the change that we want. And aiming to jump straight into a commitment to zero, to global zero, is just not something that's going to happen. But if we can get agreement around what I call a minimization agenda, if we can get a re agreement to move towards through those steps of nuclear risk reduction that I've spoken on, the four Ds, decreased numbers, decreased deployments, decreased alert, de-alerting, and of course, um, commitment to no first use doctrine, then I think um, you know, serious progress can be made. Trust builds on itself, confidence builds on itself. And if we can move to an environment where those things are in place that I've just described, the four Ds, it's still far from being a perfect world, but it's a lot safer a world than the one we live in at the moment. Of all those immediate um, risk reduction objectives, the one that I think uh, in many ways is most immediately important is a commitment to no first use. Uh, President Obama went down that particular path when he was president of the United States. He met with objections, um, not only from the hard hawks internally, but also from a lot of his own allies and partners, from my own country, from Japan, from Korea, from the NATO allies in Central and Eastern Europe, all of whom were scared that uh, giving away that, that threat of a first use exercise would somehow um, put themselves more at risk of invasion or threat than would otherwise be the case. I think that was nonsense then. I think it's nonsense now, but I think it's very, very important that um, Joe Biden, who has signaled that he's willing to go again down that particular path, gets support uh, from all the, the key allies and partners in a way that he didn't have in the past. Because if you could get that commitment from the United States, matching the commitment, which is already there from China to that effect, from India to that effect, that would build huge momentum. I live in hope that Russia will uh, also finally, hasn't at the moment, uh, see the utility, see the value in a no first use commitment and see the value in diminishing reliance on nuclear weapons and their ultimate elimination. But it's going to be a long haul, there's absolutely no doubt about that. I think there's two possible responses to the experience, the terrible experience we've all had of the COVID pandemic. One is that the world will turn further inward towards nationalistic, protectionist, exclusionary, isolationist policies with countries wanting to shut themselves off from the wider world and the risks associated with it. The other path, uh, the other outcome would be for COVID to be a big wake up call to the absolute necessity for cooperation among countries when it comes to the resolution of these problems that can't be resolved except by international cooperation. What Kofi Annan used to call problems without passports, uh, what we could also describe as global or regional public goods problems. Um, in particular, the three gigantic existential risk problems that I spoke of before in that category, pandemics and um, climate and nuclear arms control. These are problems like many others that can only be resolved by cooperation. And if COVID teaches us that lesson, then maybe we won't have done as badly as would otherwise have been the case from this terrible experience we've all had. The important thing I think, and my final word I guess, is that we should remain optimistic about the possibility for change. Its own optimism is self-reinforcing in a way that pessimism is self-defeating. It's only by believing in the possibility of change and in working for that change that any of us 
have any chance of seeing that change. I believe that uh, the kind of work that Luxembourg Forum is doing, the kind of work that so many other NGOs and civil society organisations are doing around the world is incredibly crucial in harnessing that energy that is out there in our respective communities. And I do remain optimistic that if we continue to stick the course and to believe in this dream of a nuclear weapons free world, we will, we will ultimately realise it.